Hey folks, this is Mark Emery with the Lighthouse Law Club. Coming to you today, I'm going to talk a little bit about status, standing, and agency, and why these are so important when you're dealing in any courtroom situation. If you can understand the meaning of these three key terms, how it can be used to your benefit, you can pretty much go into court and destroy just about any court case coming against you. All right, So we're going to learn these concepts and how to use them to win in court. Now in our uh, in the law club we had a members only web conference here a few weeks ago. We got into some of these subjects and what I'm going to share with you here today it's kind of an introduction to some of these ideas. It's not a complete treatise by any means or stretch of the imagination, but it's going to be a good introduction for you to really kind of see what's possible and give you some tools right now that you'll be able to use. And we hope that uh, with this insight, you'll be able to see the value of pursuing this kind of knowledge and wisdom a little bit more in depth which is what we get into in the law club. So let's, uh, let's get at it. Jump right in. Okay. What is status? Let me just read you Black's Law Dictionary. You can follow along with me. The status of a person is his legal position or condition. Thus, when we say that the status of a woman after a decree nisi for the dissolution of her marriage with her husband has been made, but before it has been made absolute, is that of a married woman. We mean that she has the same legal rights, liabilities, and disabilities as an ordinary married woman. The term is chiefly applied to persons under disability or persons who have some peculiar condition which prevents the general law from applying to them in the same way as it does to ordinary persons. Okay, that's one definition coming from uh, Barney versus uh, Tort Lot case law. Okay, so we can see there are certain rights and duties with certain capacities and incapacities to take rights and incur duties by which persons as subjects of law are variously determined to certain classes. So the rights, duties, capacities, or incapacities which determine a given person to any of these classes constitute a condition or status which the person is invested. All right, so your status determines what rights, duties, and obligations you are entitled to or responsible for. An agent for, let's say, a corporate legal entity operating under the bankruptcy is bound by the legal duties and obligations applicable to such parties. He can't come in and claim rights under the Republic as secured by the Constitution. This is why judges who recognize you as a legal vassal of the bankruptcy will threaten you with contempt if you bring up the Constitution in that court because you are not a person entitled to those as per your status. You get it? So your status is one thing. How the court perceives your status is perhaps a different thing. They could be the same thing. But that's a key element as to how the law applies to you. Okay. So likewise, if you've properly secured your legal status as a national, as opposed to a federal citizen, federal corporate citizen under the bankruptcy, you should not be claiming any relief by way of the legislative statutes. Because your status doesn't entitle you to that. You can't mix them. Okay? So you have to know who you are and what rules apply to you, and then invoke those rules and be prepared to defend them. All right, and this only comes with knowledge and perhaps some practice. All right, let's take a look at just a few examples of legal status. All right, you you very well may be a citizen. Citizen of who or what? U.S. citizen, 
Are you a resident? Are you a state citizen? Are you an American national? You could be a non-resident foreign national, foreign resident, naturalized citizen, tourist, secured creditor, and you could be single or married. And the list goes on. Okay, so you can see there is a long list of different types of legal status and depending on your legal status that will determine how your rights and obligations will be treated under the law. All right, so status is critical. All right, so let's look at standing. Standing really has three requirements. In order to have standing, the court Standing is what gives you the ability to present yourself to the court. If you do not have proper standing, if you're not a, for example, if you're not a party to a suit or an issue that's before the court, you have no standing to be before the court. Okay? Um, so generally, if you're not a plaintiff, defendant, an attorney representing one of the parties, if you're not a called witness or, or recognized as a friend of the court, you have no standing. The court will not listen to you. Uh, whatever you say has no bearing. You don't have standing. So there's three requirements for standing. One is injury in fact. So the plaintiff must have suffered or imminently will suffer injury. An invasion of a legally protected interest that is either A, concrete and particularized, or B, actual or imminent, which is neither conjectural nor hypothetical nor abstract actual or imminent, real, okay? The injury can be either economic, non-economic, or both, all right? So there must be some injury involved uh, for a person to have standing to come before a court, either involved or pending, right? Imminent. Secondly, there must be causation. There must be a causal connection between the injury and the conduct complained of so that the injury is fairly traceable to the challenged action of the defendant and not the result of the independent action of some third party who is not before the court. Okay, so that's pretty easy to see. And then redressability is the third requirement for standing. It must be likely, as opposed to merely speculative, that a favorable court decision will redress the injury. In other words, the court can resolve the matter properly, okay? So this is what standing is all about. If you don't have any reason to be before the court, if you're not a party to the issue, if you don't have an injury, if there isn't causation that can be identified linking the defendant to the case and the court cannot redress the injuries, then that case and the parties have no standing to be before the court, okay? So that's important to understand. A right of a people to challenge the conduct of another person in court is essentially standing, okay? In other words, the court will hear you, you can enter evidence, you can challenge the conduct of another person who has injured you. That's pretty much what that comes down to, okay? So, what is agency? Let's talk about that. A relation created either by express or implied contract or by law, whereby one party, either the principal or constituent, one party delegates the transaction of some lawful business or the authority to do certain acts for him or in relation to his rights or property with more or less discretionary power to another person. This other person would be called the agent, the attorney, the proxy, or the delegate, who undertakes to manage the affair and render him an account thereof. Okay, so essentially your agent is someone who you have granted power to do something for you using a fair amount of discretion. Just get the job done operating within these guidelines, and this is what that agent is authorized to do. Okay. We see that quite often uh, with powers of attorney uh, in corporate matters. Um, similar 
powers issued by a trustee, perhaps in a business trust, things like that. Okay, so the contract of agency may be defined to be a contract by which one of the contracting parties confides the management of some affair to be transacted on his account to the other party who undertakes to do the business and render an account of it. Okay? To a contract by which one person with greater or less discretionary power undertakes to represent another in certain business relations. Okay? So a relation between two or more persons by which one party, usually called the agent or attorney, those terms are interchangeable, is authorized to do certain acts for or in relation to the rights or property of the other who is denominated the principal constituent or employer. That's from Bouvier's. Okay? So without agents, a legal person, a corporation, a trust, or any entity can do nothing. Agents are everywhere. They are functionaries of all the corporate entities of the world, which, as we know, is the world of the dead. Any entity must have an agent to do anything. Any public official, functionary, agent, clerk, or administrator is an agent for its principal. All right, wherever there's an agent, there is a principal. The principal is the one who holds the ultimate power and delegates that power to the agent to act on its behalf. So, to do commerce, an entity must have a registered office and a registered agent. We're talking about legal entities, right? Set up a corporation or any kind of a corporate entity, you've got to have a registered office to receive a service of process and a registered agent for the same purpose. Set up, you know, any corporation and it's got to have these things or it's not considered a viable legal entity. So you are, are the presumed agent for the dead entity with the name similar to yours. You are presumed to be acting in a representative capacity for the principal, which is the straw man, all caps name. And they're holding you responsible. So it's, it's this agency relationship which makes you liable to pay the charges levied against the entity. The entity is dead. They need a live agent to interact with. And guess what? They've selected you. <laughs> Mighty big of them, huh? So to avoid having the responsibility for these charges put upon you, the man or woman, you must either sever this relationship altogether or claim ownership of the entity, take control of it and the estate. And I know many of you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? If not, these are things that we get into in the law club, all right? So, let's look at some more definitions that are, are of interest here. We talked about attorneys being an agent, right? Did you know that a torn is a verb? The word attorney comes from the verb. To a torn is to turn over money, rent, or goods to another. You're turning something over. I'm going to torn my goods while I'm traveling to my agent. Two, to torn is to assign a specific function or service. You're torning your authority to handle that specific function or service to an agent. Right? Okay. So, that leads us to attorney, which is a noun. One definition is this, an agent. An attorney is an agent. This is a legal definition. All right. An agent or someone authorized to act for another. Definition number two, an attorney is a person who has been qualified by a state or federal court to provide legal services including appearing in court. All right. So whenever you see the word attorney, you know that we're dealing with an agent acting on behalf of somebody else. Now, an attorney, in fact, takes this one step further. This also is a noun. An attorney, in fact, 
may be considered an alternate, a legal appointee, a legal representative, a proxy, a surrogate. Okay? Keep that in mind while we look at the definition for power of attorney. All right? A power of attorney is a written document in which one person, who is the principal, appoints another person to act as an agent on his or her behalf, thus conferring authority on the agent to perform certain acts or functions on behalf of the principal. Powers of attorney are routinely granted to allow the agent to take care of a variety of transactions for the principal, such as executing a stock power, handling a tax audit, or maintaining a safe deposit box, could be anything. Opening a bank account. Powers of attorney can be written to be either general, which is a full power of attorney. They can do anything required by the business to manage this business or to maintain this home or to manage this legal case, whatever the case may be. Or it can be limited to special circumstances. A limited power of attorney might be one to act on behalf of this corporation only to open the bank account in this particular area, okay, under specific terms and conditions, okay? So, general or full power of attorney or limited power of attorney. A power of attorney generally is terminated when the principal dies or becomes incompetent, but the principal can revoke the power of attorney at any time. So we can see that an attorney is also an agent. Could that also be an attorney in fact? Power of attorney, attorney at law? These are oftentimes quite interchangeable, right? Just as a point of interest, um, I've worked quite a bit with corporations uh, in various parts of the world and uh, have very often operated with both a general or full power of attorney. It wasn't my corporation. I wasn't the owner or stockholder, nor was I an officer uh, of the entity, but I operated with full power of attorney to do whatever is necessary for that particular company. Uh, or if it was a company I was more vested in, I might have been involved in issuing a limited power of attorney to people to help me do different things, such as opening the bank account, or buying a car, or you know anything that I required. And once they completed that task, then that limited power of attorney uh, basically um, became null and void. I have often uh, signed my name, in fact, as an attorney, or attorney in fact. And people don't understand these terms or definitions and if you sign your name as an attorney, what are you? You're an agent. If you're an attorney for a company, you're an agent for that company. And I would often sign my name with that as my title, attorney or attorney in fact. And people would say, oh, you're a lawyer? I never knew that. And I wouldn't say yes or no. I let them believe whatever they want to believe understanding full well that my signature was 100% complete, accurate, and lawful. So this is where your understanding can quite often allow people to make their own inferences, assumptions, and presumptions. All right? And you can be entirely correct. So just an interesting uh, point there. In my digging, I came up with this. It's kind of an interesting point, and it may mean nothing, but I just wanted to raise this just to uh, stimulate your thought processes a little bit. Uh, I came across denationalization, which is the act of changing a government-run firm into a private sector firm. In order to accomplish this transition, the government must either sell or otherwise redistribute the formerly government-run firm in a way that is equitable to its citizens. Denationalization is also known as privatization. So I was scratching my head and I'm just wondering, has the Republic form of government been considered a firm? We know we're operating the United States in a corporate business capacity, right? That's operated as a firm. It's a business, revenue generating business. Has the Republic form of government been privatized? 
Now, to take that one step further, just to lend some credence to that thought, think of this. Going back to the definition, the government must either sell or otherwise redistribute the formerly government-run firm, the Republic, in a way that's equitable to its citizens. Okay. Now, with that in mind, think about this. Your equity has been your equity for the bankruptcy, your equity for the privatization of the Republic, which has been spun off and is no longer part of the federal corporation, your equity has been released from the obligations of paying debts. You don't have to pay debts anymore, and you, you understand that if you understand House Joint Resolution 192. So what they did for its citizens was to grant you equity, was to release you from the obligations of paying debts due to the bankruptcy in exchange for the privilege of discharging your liabilities with credit instruments. Nothing ever gets paid, we just swap credit instruments. So think about this, you are the original, the grantor, the issuer of credit, the owner and the beneficiary, right? You're the original, the real deal. Derivatives have been created via the bonds being traded in your all caps name. These are investments that have been created, the derivative investments using this entity in your name in all caps. So a constructive trust is created when these bonds are created. You never addressed the issue as beneficiary or made any claim against those, so it was deemed abandoned. Therefore, you are deemed incompetent and your office is vacant, so the estate is administered for you and you, the man or the woman, are held liable as the trustee slash surety slash agent. So now you are appointed the trustee and the person responsible. You are the debtor who will pay all charges against your name. Now think about this in terms of what's going on in court. Okay, again, these dead corporate fictional entities must have a living person to act as agent in order for them to do anything. So they want to nab you as that person to be the debtor. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So let's look at this. Let's look at the law of the flag. You may have come across this before. It's a principle of maritime and international law that the sailors and the vessel will be subject to the laws of the state corresponding to the flag flown by the vessel. All right, you see all these ships that are registered to Panama or to Liberia. Why? Because they have very favorable uh, legislation relating to taxes and requirements, and, and they encourage registration of vessels in those jurisdictions. It's a business forum, all right? Just like tax havens used to be a business in the Caribbean, not anymore. All right, so the law of the flag is Whatever flag that ship is flying represents the rules that will govern any contracts that you enter into once you're on that ship or engaging with the captain, right? So when charges are brought and you plead not guilty, you're saying that you don't agree to pay the charges. And if you are found guilty, you either pay in cash or you pay from the bond that's created when they send you to jail. Going to jail creates cash flow, and this is how the debt is paid. And so what they do is they get people to enter upon the ship. By doing so, you enter into a contract with the captain. The gold-fringed military flag with the eagle on top represents maritime jurisdiction, it's a military flag in international law. Basically, they're bringing the law of the sea upon the land in order to operate in accordance with the law of the sea. You must enter upon the ship and enter into contract with the captain. You with me? Okay. Now, I know some people who are not 
well-informed about these issues, they laugh at that. They go, oh, <laughs> you're crazy. You know, you got these stupid patriot arguments and, you know, you guys are just off your rockers chasing rainbows, right? Well, I got something here for you scoffers, all right? Share this with your scoffers. This is the Miami Federal Courthouse. So for those of you laughing, take a good look at this. This is taken from Google Maps, zoomed in on the Federal Courthouse building. What do you see in that picture? It's the shape of a hull of a ship. These people know exactly what they're doing. It's not an accident. It's not happenstance. It's not fantasy. Do you think this just happened by, by accident when the architects put together the design of this building that somehow this shape and design was required for other purposes and it just turned out this way by accident? Look at the, uh, look at the smokestack right in the center of the hull. Look at the power plants, the air conditioners as power plants back where the engines of the ship would be. This is no accident. These people know exactly what they're doing. They're shoving it in your face. And most of us are just too stupid to understand what's going on. Or we're too ignorant, we don't even want to know. And so what happens? They haul you onto their ship, they dress you down, they, they tie you to the mast, they give you 20 lashes, and then they boot your ass off the ship uh, after they plunder you, take all your money, and you're tossed into the ocean, uh, uh, bleeding and, and half drowning to death, right? Isn't that pretty much what happens when you go into court? All right, you can't argue that. So, for you scoffers, study this and get to know what's really going on, all right? So, let's take a hypothetical court appearance. We're going to address this and understanding status, standing in agency, I'm going to give you some examples as to how you can walk in to the courtroom, address the captain in a proper way, address the prosecutor in the proper way, understanding these principles, holding them accountable, and you will be able to dress down any opponents that might be trying to drag you onto their ship to contract with them so that they can do nothing but fleece you and beat you in public. That's what they do. All right? So this is what we're going to do. I've got several tracks we're going to run on. I'm going to give you an introduction to some of the different tracks you can use. And you could, pot, you could surely use all of them as to uh, how this might go down. So we're going to talk about a hypothetical court appearance, all right? You walk in, and the judge calls the case. The state versus John Q. Defendant, case number 94, uh, CR 2231. Parties may come forward. All right, the county prosecutor will enter his or her appearance. Judge, I'm uh, Susie Prosecutor. I'm my bar card number is uh, 431, and uh, I'm here representing the state on this issue through the um, district attorney's office. And uh, so now maybe they're looking at you. You haven't crossed the bar yet, right? You're smart enough not to do that. You're not entering into contract. And so you stand up in the gallery, and. Uh, you make your appearance right there in the gallery. Judge, I'm here in propria persona, making a special appearance as grantor and beneficiary of the estate being administered in this case, relating to the named defendant. Now note, you're not admitting to be the defendant, right? Key point, don't do that. You are making a special appearance as grantor and beneficiary of the estate being administered in this case. What's the estate? The estate is all the accounts that have been created in the fictional straw man name. That's what they're administering. 
They're operating in bankruptcy. Chapter 11. In fact, I think it's Title 11 in the U.S. Code. In any event, everything is being administered under the bankruptcy. All right? And in the bankruptcy, they're dealing with a dead person who is the defendant, your name in all caps, which is essentially probate, and so you're dealing with the estate. For the named defendant. So, continuing. I'm not here in a representative capacity. And, Judge, just for the record, this, uh, this is a court of record. Am I right? Yes? This is a court of record. Great. Okay, for the record, I reserve all rights at all times and waive none ever. So now the judge is getting a little bit testy. Who are you? And he's going to try and trick you to get you to admit your name. As soon as you say your name out loud in public, they will assume you have admitted being the defendant. Okay, in all caps. Who are you? What's your name? If you're not John Q. Defendant, we will deem him absent and we'll issue a warrant for his arrest and proceed accordingly. Your response might be, Judge, I'm here to help administer this matter for the benefit of the court. If the prosecutor has a valid claim against me, the man who is beneficiary to the estate of the defendant, let me see it, and I'll tell you if I am the named party or not. Mr. Prosecutor, please present me with the verified claim. And at this point, he's going to be looking a little bit cross-eyed, and maybe his face is starting to get a little bit flushed. All right. So he kind of shrugs his shoulders and he's like, what? And, and the judge starts badgering you now, right? He's badgering you to come in here, sit down at the, at the defendant's table, and let's deal with this matter. Judge, for the record, if I cross the bar, am I entering into a contract with the court? Yes or no? You want to get it on the record. Now, he is not going to answer that question. And you might persist. Judge, before proceeding any further, I need to know if I cross the bar, am I entering into a contract with the court? Yes or no? All right? He's going to start blowing a stack and blowing steam out of his ears. All right? And no matter what he says, no matter what he threatens, doesn't matter. Just, just look at it like the, uh, the old Charlie Brown uh, cartoons. When the, the kids are in school and the teacher's talking, it's just wah, 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 Okay? You don't hear anything. You stay on your track. All right? Judge, with all due respect, I have no intention to board your ship. I operate under the laws of the Republic, and I hereby invoke the laws of the Republic. Look up Article 4, Section 4 in the U.S. Constitution. This is your authority, okay? Now, you can't bring up the Constitution in the courtroom unless or until you invoke the laws of the Republic and you're operating under the Republic because they are not. Understand that, okay? So I invoke the laws of the Republic to manage my affairs in my court. I'm here in my court. I'm going to set my court. And you have every right to do so. The judge does not own the court. It's there for the public and the people in the public to use for their benefit. And that includes you. So you need to take the posture of taking control of the courtroom and not allowing them to bully you or to distract you or to take charge and run over you. You have to take control and not let them do the same to you. So you continue. My court is hereby set under the laws of the Republic. I can operate just fine from here. Thank you, Judge. And I'm here to help you administer this case expeditiously. So let's get on with it. Okay? Now, what do you notice here? You're not just sitting back waiting for the judge to take command, are you? You have just taken command. All right? Here's who I am. Here's my court. I've set my court. This is the laws that I operate under. And I can do just fine from here back in the gallery. Thank you, Judge. And uh, I'm here to help you administer this case expeditiously. So let's get on with it, all right? So you've offered your assistance to resolve this matter quickly, which the judge likes to hear that because uh, he's got, you know, quite a docket for the day, and uh, 
he's got a golf date later this afternoon and he, he doesn't want to be late, right? Okay, so you want to help him administer the case expeditiously. So let's continue. There is a possibility the judge could continue to threaten you. And so you might come back, judge, if you force me to cross the bar against my will, with threats of force and imprisonment being used against me, it's only under duress that I would comply, not willingly or voluntarily. You understand what duress is, right? And there will be no contracts assumed or presumed by my presence. My law, you've invoked the laws of the Republic, right? My law follows me wherever I go with my reservation of rights intact at all times. For the record, Judge, are we clear on that? You want to tie him down to get him to acquiesce to your terms. And he'll just try to distract you and throw distractions and threats and other things with you. Bring him, ignore all that, bring him back on point. Excuse me, Judge, but I need a reply to my question for clarity of the record. I said, I will comply with your request under duress. And on the terms I just stated, are we clear on that? Yes. All right, so you're leading him with the answer, and he's not going to answer. And so you say, okay, so I'll take your silence or lack of response as consent. Let the record reflect that the judge has accepted my terms, and we will proceed on that basis. Thank you, judge. You are polite and professional at all times. <laughs> you see how this works, okay? Now, it's going to take some guts to do this. You're going to have to have confidence and guts. This is your court, and you're going to manage your court the way you see fit. Don't let them bully you. And we've only just begun. Believe me, wait till you see what's coming, okay? So that's that scenario and one possible way of dealing it. All right, so the judge continues to ignore you. Here's another possibility. Excuse me, Judge. Now, before you proceed, there are some administrative matters to attend to, which will serve to expedite this matter for the court. I need to, I need to address the, the prosecutor or the county attorney or whoever he is. You just identify him correctly for the plaintiff. Okay? So, again, the judge is just ignoring you. You've set the record. By his silence, you have set the record. And you're proceeding accordingly. Okay? Okay? And so now is when you pivot from the judge to the prosecutor. All right, judge, I've got some uh, administrative matters to attend to with the county attorney, and uh, I need to address him for just a minute. So if I may, let's talk to the prosecutor. Mr. Prosecutor, do you have a claim against me, the living man who is beneficiary of this estate? If so, please present it now so I can examine it. Where's your verified claim? Please show me. And he'll distract and defer and him and haw. All right. And, and again, you got to hold their feet to the fire. He might say something like, well, we have a complaint in this case against John Q. Defendant, which I presume is you. Again, they're trying to trick you and trap you into admitting that you are the defendant, which you're not. You are not that dead person, corporate entity. And you respond, no, I just stated clearly for the record who I am, and I am not the agent trustee nor the named defendant or surety against which you seek to settle your matter. I am the beneficiary. Let me repeat my question. Do you, Mr. Prosecutor, have a claim against me, the grantor and beneficiary of this estate, yes or no? And he's honestly going to be a little bit confused and could react any one of a number of different ways which you don't care how he reacts, all right? It doesn't matter, all right? He might come back and say, well, we have charges brought by the state against John Q. Defendant for a violation of state statute 43-11-5678. That's a fake number. And you reply, against whom? Not me. Again, for the record, you have no claim against me. You've not shown me any claim. I am the beneficiary of the named estate living upon the land in the Republic. I believe you want me to stand in for the defendant as the trustee and debtor, which is a mistake for the record, which I need to correct. The record stands corrected. 
because that is not my capacity. And if you claim so, you need to establish documentary evidence and enter it into the record now. Do you have it? And he's shrugging. He's, you know, fumbling through his papers. He's complaining to the judge. Judge, uh, this is all irrelevant. We need to proceed. All right, they're going to try to ignore you and keep moving. And you step in again. I ask, who here in this court who can hear my voice has a claim against me? Please come forward with your claim. Who can present a contract to which I am being held liable as the man upon the land in my venue, which is the law of the republic? Anybody? Does anybody here have a contract here to present? Mr. Prosecutor, you want me to believe that there is a claim against me, yet you have shown nothing to this court to support your position. And then you proceed. Okay, judge, let the court reflect that the Mr. Prosecutor has not presented to the court or to me any documentation which supports a verified claim against me. Judge, I move this court to dismiss this case as the prosecutor has failed to establish any claim upon which relief can be granted. So what you're doing here is you're basically proving that the prosecutor does not have a valid claim. They might have a citation issued by a police officer. They might have uh, perhaps an information filed by uh, the district attorney's office. Uh, they may even have a, a grand jury indictment. Okay. So whatever the case is, present it. Let me see it. And you know it's going to be in the all caps name. It's not going to be against you, the man or woman living upon the land. They need to establish that they want to hold you, the human being, the individual, liable for the corporate fiction. All right, that's the whole point that we're getting at here. All right, and what you're doing is you're proving for the record that they do not have this. So we're just getting started. That's track one. Let's move to track two. Mr. Prosecutor, are you a witness on this case prepared, prepared to testify under oath with first-hand knowledge and information related to the alleged charges in this matter? Of course he's not. No, no, I'm representing the state. And this is perfect. You're leading him into a trap. Ah, uh, I see. So you then are a state licensed attorney at law representing the plaintiff, correct? He'll say, yes, that's correct. And he'll feel very proud of that fact. <laughs> Hold on, it gets fun. All right, Mr. Prosecutor, then I need you to enter into the record of this proceeding your license to practice law issued by the state not a private bar card, but an actual license issued by the state to establish that you have proper standing as an agent for the plaintiff to even talk to me about this matter. Please do that now. And more than talk to you, talk to the court. This goes to showing that he has standing in the court, right? If he can't show that he's a licensed attorney, all right, now, what was your question in the beginning? After he says, no, I'm representing the state, you lead him with the question, oh, I see, so you are a state licensed attorney at law. And this is going on the record. State licensed. And he says, yes. He's not even thinking. Now, you should probably research the statutes in your state as to what's required to be a practicing attorney. Have those laws in your head or maybe even copies of them for reference in the courtroom okay so you've let him into a trap he doesn't have a state license because no such thing exists all right and so now you're establishing for the record that he's a liar he's misleading you and the court and he doesn't have the license that he says he does that gets interesting doesn't it can you produce a state license for the court Yes or no? Please do that now. Do you have your state license? 
Well, I have my bar card. No, I didn't ask for your bar card. I asked for your state issued license. You said you are a state licensed attorney. You just said that for the record. So I want to see your license. Please enter that for the record of this proceeding. Oh, so you don't, oh, you don't have that with you, okay? If he uses that excuse, he doesn't have it with him. You could move for an adjournment until he, until he comes up with one, but that's not really what you're asking for. You want to blow this thing out of the water right here and now. You don't want to come back, all right? So again, we're setting the record. Let the record reflect, Judge, that Mr. or Mrs. Prosecutor cannot produce any evidence to the court that he is who he says he is. And he's an imposter, illegally passing himself off as someone who he is not. Judge, I move this court for dismissal on grounds that Mr. Prosecutor has not established proper standing as an attorney at law, licensed to represent his client in this court, and the plaintiff is without proper representation and has no standing in this court since the plaintiff is not present. All right, the judge at this point is going to be getting quite perplexed <laughs> and looking for excuses, looking for uh, demurrals. He might start attacking you, um, trying to get you to argue something else to get you off your point, and you just got you ignore all that and stay on point. Okay, so that's track two. Prosecuting attorney has no license, therefore they have no standing. Got it? So let's go on track three. Mr. Prosecutor, are you, are you going to be presenting your client, the plaintiff, as a witness to testify under oath with first-hand knowledge and information related to the alleged charges in this matter? And of course he's not, so he'll say, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. It's like, you know, come on, buddy, get a clue. No, it doesn't work that way. Ah, I see. So then we're not operating in equity, and we must be operating at law. In that case, please present me and the court with the underlying contract which you want to hold the defendant, not me, which you want to hold the defendant accountable to. You can do that, correct? Please present the contract now that the plaintiff has with the defendant. I'll wait. So again, there's no contract. There's no one to testify under oath as to a damage, then how can there be a claim? No one can testify that there's a damage and there's no contract. All right, they're operating in law, so there must be a contract. They want to hold you accountable to the corporate bylaws relating to um, traffic infractions or filing papers infractions or whatever the case might be, right? All right, show me the contract. No, no contract. Judge, let the record reflect, please, that the prosecutor cannot produce the plaintiff as a witness under oath, nor can he produce a contract to which he wants to hold the defendant liable to. Therefore, he has no standing in law or equity. Boom. Judge, I move this court for dismissal for want of prosecution and failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. Want of prosecution means there's nobody here to prosecute this case. There's no contract. There's no damage. There's no claim. All right, so that's track three. Having fun yet? <laughs> ah, this is a lot of fun. Let's go on to track four. All right, we got more. Much more. Mr. Prosecutor, you mentioned earlier that you are representing the plaintiff in this case, correct? You're leading him. You want to get the answer on the record, right? Don't let him wiggle out. Get it on the record. Yes. Then I need to see the contract between you and the state, your client, the plaintiff, which gives you the power of attorney to represent the plaintiff before this court. Do you have that contract to present to the court? Yes or no? I want a yes or no. Do you have it or don't you? And as soon as he hymns and haws, I'll take that as a no. You failed to produce it. He might come across with something like, well, I work for the, the county attorney's office or the district attorney's office. Everybody knows that we represent the state on these matters. It's standard procedure. Something like that. 
you know, mightier and holier than thou. Okay? Condescending. It's like, who are you, you numbskull? Talking to you. All right? So you say, very good. Very good. But you want to make a claim against the defendant. And I don't know who you are or who you work for. I don't operate on assumptions and presumptions, only documented facts. This court only recognizes the documented facts. By saying that, you just put the judge on the hot seat. No assumptions and presumptions here, right? Documented facts. Please produce your representation contract or power of attorney with your client. For the record, to establish your authority and legal relationship with the plaintiff so that this court can see that you have proper standing. If he can't show that he has the power of attorney, that he's actually a legal representative, an agent, an attorney for the plaintiff, the state, he's got no business being there. And the court can't hear him. And you're bringing this out. So again, Judge, let the record reflect that Mr. Prosecutor has not established his authority to act on this matter and thus has no standing to be before this court. Judge, I move this court for dismissal for the prosecutor's failure to establish proper standing before this court as agent for the plaintiff. All right, now the judge, <laughs> the judge is in a real spot because you're asking for things that he cannot produce. But by law, he must produce. You're ripping him to shreds. <laughs> Honestly, by this time, you should be well down the street at the coffee house uh, yucking it up with your buddies uh, about what went on in the courtroom. Okay, uh, So this is much more ammunition than hopefully you're ever going to need, but let's continue. Let's drop a bombshell, shall we? You like dropping bombshells? <laughs> Mr. Prosecutor, you are conducting your activities and seeking to settle charges amongst the people in the public. So surely you can produce the payment and performance bonds which provide indemnity for yourself or your principal in the event of any missteps which may occur, which may cause damage to the public. So please produce for the court and the record here the bond or bonds for this action in particular not a general bond, for this action in particular, which gives you the authority to impose yourself upon the public with indemnity. Surely you can do that. Am I correct? And by now, he's hanging his head. He's looking around like, is there someone here who can help me? <laughs> and now the judge has to get on your side. You know, he just has to. The judge, the judge should be berating this guy. What, you mean you don't have your bonds? You don't have bonds? You're not bonded on this action? You don't have any bonds to produce for the court? So you're not bonded. I see. Then you don't have any standing or authority to be acting or dealing in the public. Mr. Prosecutor, why are we here? You have nothing. No claim, no standing, no agency, no contract, no witness, no bond, no authority. You're fired, you're making a mockery of this court. You're wasting this court's time. You're wasting public taxpayer dollars. You must leave now. Go. You are in control. Take control of this situation. And with this information, it should give you every bit of confidence. You'll just need to be able to step in when they're trying to talk over you, when they're trying to railroad you, when they're trying to get you off the dime, distract you, and so forth, okay? So judge, for the record, there is no case here. The prosecutor is wasting everyone's time. The court reflects, or the record reflects, that this case is null and void ab initio, nunc pro tunc. Now for then, from the beginning. And I require you to confirm its dismissal. You're not asking the judge, okay? You're telling him, I require you, judge, to confirm this case is dismissed. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be of assistance in this matter. I'm out of here. And away you go. You might be interested just to stick around for a minute just to uh, see how much steam can come out of these guys' ears. See how red their faces can get. 
see uh, how they want to powwow with their teams <laughs> and try and figure out what the hell happened. I've seen that happen in courtrooms that I've been in. <laughs> they don't know what to do, so they go back to the, to the back of the room and they powwow with, with all their teammates saying, oh my God, now what do we do? Sheesh, what, 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 do, you, what do you think, Julie? Uh, uh, how do we deal with this? Um, now, we have more. <laughs> So the judge wants to steamroll you. You've never seen that happen, have you? He just wants to ignore everything you have to say, and they're just moving forward no matter what. All right. So here's one approach to think about. Excuse me, judge, but I will not be denied due process. And if you attempt to deny me the due process I am entitled to, which you are required to ensure by your contract with me via your oath, then you are acting ultra viris. That's outside of your authority. And you would be in contempt of your duty, your oath, and my God-given rights in my venue, which would put you right smack dab in the middle of accepting full personal liability for the damage you may cause in any ultra viris acts, which interfere with my rights as a man upon the land in my venue. Now, judge, remember, I operate in my venue, not in yours. In the alternative, if you wish to incorrectly presume me to be a person who is the named defendant without any evidence or proper claim establishing such, you'd be interfering with my ability to conduct commerce. It would be illegal restraint of trade per 15 U.S. Code sections 1 and 2, $1 million per offense on the individual, $100 million for the entity, Add to that RICO laws in addition to federal criminal statutes relating to the deprivation of rights under color of law, specifically sections 241 and 242, among others. Those are just a few of the laws you judge would be in contempt of. Don't threaten me with contempt. You are in contempt of due process and your contract and oath of office. If you continue along this track, and you know what, neither one of us wants to see that, do we? I mean, we should settle this matter properly and amicably, according to the law, don't you think? Notice how you soften your tone. It's a carrot and stick approach, right? You want to get tough? I can get tough. Or do you want to settle this? What, what, it's up to you, Judge. What do you want to do? Okay? Now, I certainly wouldn't want you and Mr. Prosecutor to be acting in concert on the record to steamroll me on this matter in contravention of all law, duty, and well-established jurisprudence. Now, do your duty to demand the prosecutor to properly establish himself in this case before the court as I have required, not how you may like, but as I have required, or dismiss the case. Those are your only lawful options. And so, Judge... How would you like to wish to proceed? So now, you're putting it back in his lap. Giving him the respect that he demands. So, Judge, those are your options. How would you like to proceed? <laughs> You've just put him in a box, and there's only one thing that he can do. If, if he's just not totally arrogant, ignorant, and... A whole list of other adjectives, okay? And there are those that are out there. And you've properly set the record. No matter what they do, you just object, object, object uh, for the record and uh, put them on notice of appeal. And I guarantee you, um, notice of intent to appeal. And that case will go nowhere, okay? So, here's some troubleshooting you could do. All right? Let's say none of this works. Can you imagine that none of this would, would work? Yeah, I guess maybe you probably could, the way things work these days. So here's your last and final cannon shot right into the engine room. Okay, Judge, there seems to be some miscommunication here. I've, I've not been presented with anything that names me as a defendant to any legitimate claim in my capacity as beneficiary of the named estate in my venue. I've not seen the bond supporting the action. I've not seen anything which gives the prosecutor proper standing in this court to address me on this matter. Therefore, I'm obviously at a serious disadvantage here due to lack of disclosure, discovery, or transparency in this matter. Now, since you and the prosecutor seem to be on the same page here, 
And I'm completely in the dark at this point as to how this court is operating outside of law and equity. I'm just going to appoint you as trustee over the estate of the defendant to protect my interests as beneficiary and administer this matter in a fiduciary capacity on my behalf. So please proceed as my trustee in this matter, and I thank you very much. I put it in your hands. <laughs> now, now, it's a matter of record what you've just done, and he can't proceed because he just put him in a conflict of interest. So, uh, and this has been done. This has actually been done in court, and the judges will just simply pack their books, tuck their tail between their legs, and they will escape the courtroom as quickly as possible. Every instance that I've heard. All of these tracks that we've talked about here have been used successfully. Okay, now, you're not going to use all of them. You're not going to get all this in. You're going to have to know this stuff. Think on your feet. Hold your position. Don't let them buffalo you. Don't let them get you off track. You need to set the record on these key points. Don't move off your point until the record has been set. For example, okay, let the record reflect, Judge, that the prosecutor has not presented the contract. He has no standing. You, you, they won't answer hardly any of the questions you ask them. So you have to answer for the record yourself and establish the record yourself. So you get that. And failure to object is fatal. They know that. They can't object because they got no alternative. They can't comply. The only alternative is to comply. They can't do that. So they can't object. So they're going to try and buffalo you and hope that you don't set the record properly. You set the record properly, you get those answers. Even if you have to answer for them, you can see where we're going with this. Okay? Now, you got to have the confidence and the guts to do this. It's your court. Take control of it. All right? So do your research on courts of equity, courts of law, and chancery courts. Okay? Understand the difference between the two. It's not difficult. It doesn't take a long time. You can look that up on the net and get through some of that maybe in uh, 30 minutes. It's not a big deal. Okay? It's easy. So do that. And you know, there's a lot of different laws that can be applied depending on what your legal status is and what court you're in. Are we dealing with legislative statutes and treaties, constitutional law, federal law? If you're a U.S. citizen in a federal court, state law, are you a state resident with a residence in the state of and doing business in the state of those Corporate bylaws for the state, i.e. state laws, might apply to you. Are we dealing with common law? You know, is there actually an injured party involved? You know, are we talking case law, which could be precedent? Some case law is weightier than others. Some case law has carries no weight. All right? These are things you need to understand. We're dealing in commercial law? Good. Where's the contract? Are we dealing with agency regulations and executive orders? Those apply very specifically to very specific individuals in very specific situations. All right, so again, your status may very well determine how the laws or which laws might be applying to you in your own case. So just be aware of that. And uh, hopefully we brought some ideas for you to think about and... Uh, with this, this information, and maybe a little bit more, again, we've only kind of introduced some of these topics. These are the kind of things that we get into in the Law Club, and we would encourage you to, uh, if you want to pursue this, to join us in the Law Club. With that, stay out of court. <laughs> if you do go to court, have fun. <laughs> Sometimes, honestly, I used to go into court for recreation. If you... Uh, Ever get a chance to read my book, One Free Man's War and the Second Revolution, Second American Revolution, you'll, you'll see a lot of the escapades that I had just going into court, running circles around these guys, having all kinds of fun. So don't worry about court. 
you know, have a good time, enjoy yourself, take care of your business, get in, get out, move on, get on with things. Okay? Pretty straightforward. So, enjoy, take care, and God bless. We'll see you in the next video.